I'm Andrew White. I'm a writer, filmmaker and broadcaster. And one of my passions is walking. As the editor of Walks Around Britain, I've walked all across this country, from the Highlands of Scotland to the Channel Islands. I've been there discovering the best walking Britain has to offer. But as a Yorkshireman, I always have a special place in my heart for walking in my home county. And now I'm undertaking a series of walks to one of the most undiscovered parts of Yorkshire, the East Riding. Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of East Yorkshire Walks with me, Andrew White. And on today's programme, we're going to be taking two walks, as always, very varied ones across East Yorkshire. Later on, I'll be walking alongside the River Ouse in Goul. But first, I'm in Flamborough for a walk along the cliffs. And this one starts at the very heart of the village of Flamborough. And it's this way then. So from the village centre, I'm heading northwards along North Marine Road along a footpath towards Thornwick Bay, then along the cliff path of the Headland Way, past North Landing to get to the lighthouse. Here you could take a shortcut back along Lighthouse Road to the village, but I'm carrying on on the Headland Way along South Cliff to South Landing, and then back to the village from Beacon Hill. It's around seven miles, and because it's along the cliff path, it's quite a challenging walk. <laughs> Flamborough's rich history goes back thousands of years, far beyond written records. And being nestled on the coast makes this a community intrinsically linked to the sea. There is evidence invaders crossed from mainland Europe over the centuries and settled here. To the west of the village, there's a two and a half mile ravine which separates the village and the surrounding headland from the rest of England. Now half of it is natural, but the other half was man-made, probably dating back to 547 AD. And when the Vikings came across in the 8th century, they did more work on it, hence its name, Dane's Dyke. Just a little way out of the village, and there's a public footpath here on the left, heading towards Thornwick Bay. And the path is clearly defined here. The origin of the name Flamber has never been definitively pinned down, but one guess is that it comes from the Old Norse word for spear or arrow because of the shape of the headland and also that it points out to sea. The route of the walk now follows part of the Headland Way, a 20 mile long distance trail from Bridlington to Filey via the Flamber Cliffs. The way is well signposted, but it's always worth checking your map for safety. The walk heads down towards the sea, before some steps head back up the cliff on the right. But I want to have a look at the bay first. The stunning Thornwick Bay is said to get its name from Thor, the Norse god of thunder, because of the roaring sound made by the waves breaking on the rocks, especially during the northeasterly game. There are two shingle bays here, this one and a smaller one around this headland here called Little Thornwick Bay, and at low tides you can walk along the beach between them. The cliffs here are dotted with caves, and Smuggler's Cave just round the corner is the largest on the east coast of England. Right, back to the walk, and up those steps to the top of the cliff. The area of Flamborough Head is very important, both in wildlife and geological terms. It is a special area of conservation, a site of special scientific interest, and the Flamborough Cliffs here are also a nature reserve, with one of the most important seabird colonies in Europe.
During the summer, the cliffs along here are full with breeding seabirds, including fulmers, herring gulls, kittiwakes, guillemots, razorbills and puffins. Today is especially windy. Care is certainly needed when walking along this cliff path. This is a fantastic place for spotting some wild flowers, which also attract butterflies, including the small kipper and the ringlet. The path along here does get wet very often, so will probably be muddy. The beach at North Landing is dog friendly too, so next time I'll bring my four dogs for a paddle. This part of the walk has some amazing bays and inlets, many with Viking influenced names. The Stottle from Stottle Bank is Icelandic for station, and Bink from Stottle Bink is a shelf of rocks. Whilst Sticks is from the Danish word for a column of rock. Standing on Kindle Scar really highlights the constant battle between the sea and the coastline of Flamborough. A battle which the sea every so often claims a victory, eroding parts of the land at its weakest points to form new bays and inlets. Here at Flamborough Head, you can get down to the beach, thanks to some recently installed steps. It's a trek down, but the sights are amazing. This is the wondrous Selwick's Bay. Flamborough Head is the UK's most northerly coastal chalk cliffs. Built from layers dating back to the Upper Jurassic through to the Cretaceous period. Forget the White Cliffs of Dover, these Yorkshire cliffs are some 50 foot higher, standing tall at 400 feet. Here you really feel you are somewhere special. Welcome to the edge of Yorkshire. It was these sheer cliffs and the multitude of treacherous sea stacks and rocky outcrops which led to the establishing of the Flamborough Head Lighthouse in 1806. It was designed by the architect Samuel Wyatt and cost £8,000, around 500000 in today's money. The lighthouse was electrified in 1940 and automated in the mid-90s with the last keepers leaving on the 8th of May 1996. It's now controlled and monitored remotely from a centre in Harwich. The light can be seen for some 24 nautical miles out to sea. There's now a visitor centre at the lighthouse and for a small fee you can have a very informative guided tour including a trip to the top of the tower. It wasn't the first lighthouse here though. One was established way back in 1669, and you'll see the Grade 2 listed tower if you take the Lighthouse Road as a shortcut back to the village. No shortcut for me as I enter the area of the Outer Headland Local Nature Reserve, 
and past the fog signal station, which gives two blasts every 90 seconds, a call unique to Flamborough. Around now from the eastern tip of the headland, past the impressive high stacks and Cattlemere Hole towards South Landing. Walking along these cliff tops really puts you in perspective with the landscape. And unusually, on the Yorkshire coast, from here you've actually got a panoramic sea view to the south. The bay here might be small, but it's quite impressive. as is the climb back to the cliff top. South Landing is home to an important colony of tree sparrows, whose numbers have declined across the country by a massive 95% over recent years. Now it's time to take a right to head back to the village on the public footpath to Beacon Farm. In the distance, you can see the Grade 2 star listed St Oswald's Church, the eldest part of which dates back to 1150. Just a bit further, and you go past the remains of Flamborough Castle. And here we are back in the village centre at the end of the walk. Now, if you manage to complete any of it, even with the shortcuts, you've done very, very well. Because I did tell you it was very challenging. Well, after the break, we've got a completely different walk. It's along the flat riverbank of the River Ouse in Gaul. Welcome back. Now after my walk along the cliffs at Flamber, I'm here at Ghoul for a walk alongside the River Ouse. From the railway station, the walk heads straight for the banks of the River Ouse and follows it through Hook all the way to Airmin, where it heads back towards the station through Ghoul Town Centre. It's an easy walk, mainly on the flat throughout, and is just over seven miles in length. Walking down the pedestrianised Booth Ferry Road, it's difficult to believe Ghoul didn't exist until the early 1800s. In fact, the building which is supposed to be the oldest in Ghoul was only built in 1824. The story of Ghoul started back in 1626, when King Charles I hired the Dutch civil engineer Cornelius Vermeuden to divert the River Don northwards by 10 miles to make it flow into this, the River Ouse, 
rather than the River Eyre, thereby draining the marshland of Hatfield Chase near Doncaster, where the king liked to go hunting. Fast forward to 1826, and the Air and Calder Navigation Company built a canal from Leeds to Goole, and that, together with the altered path of the River Don, allowed barges to bring coal from the West Riding's coal field to the new port of Goole. Here, the coal would be transferred to seagoing vessels and exported to the continent. This was the start of Goole's boom years, when it rivalled Hull as a major port on the North Sea. There were even passenger ferry services to Europe and the world, and local steam packet services to Hull and York. Today, Goole only handles a small percentage of Hull's traffic, but is still very important as the UK's most inland port, some 50 miles away from the sea. I call this walk the Three Bridge Walk, and I'm about to meet the first of the three. Because the town was originally built on the back of the canals, Goole was initially reluctant to have a railway in the area. But in 1863, the North Eastern Railway gained approval for their plans to build a railway from Hull to Doncaster via Goole. With the relatively flat land, construction of the railway was pretty easy. But when they got to Goole, they had to cross the River Ouse between Skelton and Hook and whatever they crossed it with had to allow ships and barges past too. What they came up with was this, the Ghoul Swing Bridge. It's also called the Skelton Viaduct. It was built in 1869, designed by Thomas Harrison. Harrison was the chief engineer for the North Eastern Railway and was particularly noted for his bridges. At Ghoul, he designed a girder bridge with six spans, five fixed and one swing span to allow ships and barges to pass through. At the time of construction, it was one of the largest opening bridges in the world. The swing section on the right rotates around a central column and the bridge could be opened in an amazing 50 seconds. In 2009, the bridge was strengthened with 450 tonnes of new steel installed in the existing structure, which should see it continuing to allow passengers and freight to travel between Hull and Doncaster for many more years. The ground around here gets quite muddy, but there are some picnic benches here as I walk past Hull, if you want to have a spot of lunch. Once you've turned around the top tip of land at Hook, you'll see Howden Dyke Island, or Hook Island, here in the centre. It's a 19-acre site of special scientific interest and home to bird life, including herons. Now it's time for bridge number two. The coming of the Trans-Pennine M62 motorway in the early 70s meant the need for another bridge over the River Ouse, and this one was a bit of a monster. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the Ouse Bridge. Construction started in January 1973. It was finished in May 1976. It's got 29 spans. It's nearly a mile in length. It had to be so long, as the ooze historically spread itself over a wide area, and therefore much of the surrounding countryside was liable to become waterlogged in winter. Although today, the river has been somewhat tamed by flood banks, keeping it to a width of around 950 feet at the site of the bridge. 
the approaches to the bridge on either side have a gradient of 1 in 33, which is still the steepest recommended for a motorway bridge in the UK. Because of the scale needed for the crossing, a tunnel was actually considered at one point, but this was thought to be too expensive. Thousands of drivers pass over the bridge every day without getting to see the elegant and simplistic design. Once you've gone under the M62, it's not too far to the last of the three bridges. Now, before the opening of the M62 and the Humber Bridge in 1981, the only physical road crossing across the Ewes was here at Goole, Goose Ferry Bridge. This box girder bridge was opened in 1929 to replace the old Booths Ferry, which was the longest serving ferry on the Ewes lasting until the bridge opened. It was built by the Cleveland Bridge and Engineering Company, who later was part of the group who built the Humber Bridge. It's a tad muddy around here. <laughs> Remember, good side cowed. Leave all gates as you found them. Now I've turned southwards, and for the first time on the walk, I've left the side of the ooze. On my right now is the River Air, just beyond the second line of trees. This is the small village of Airmin, which has a very prominent and impressive clock tower dedicated to the second Earl of Beverley who paid for the village school to be built in 1834. I'm on the homeward section now, and the walk heads over the M62 and along the A614 through the outer suburbs of Ghoul, before heading down Booth Ferry Road and back to the station. Well, there you go, two very different walks in East Yorkshire. I hope you've enjoyed them. And join me again for another two another time. <laughs>